in anticipation of this, I decided to put together a uh, packet. Uh, I don't know if they still sell Kool-Aid, but uh, this is like uh, Kool-Aid without the water. This is a pretty concentrated packet. Uh, much more than one could hope to go into any depth on in the course of an hour or so, but I thought that there might be some things in it that you could take away and ponder as they perhaps relate to your own life. Um, I should confess as well that as a lawyer business person, um, I can sometimes get a bit linear. Uh, I've run a private foundation for about 30 years that supports Christian ministry, and because of that, we on occasion have individuals that come to us and say, hey, we'd like to entrust some resources to you and th allow you to give them away because of what you may know about the Twin Cities. And so that happened a couple of years ago with a buddy of mine, and I made the distributions and went back to report to him. And after I gave him my report, he said, well, Jay, he said that you know, typically is very concise and straightforward. Next time we get together, can we just have ice cream? And so... Uh, I would love to have ice cream with anybody who after this has any inkling that there may be an area of interest. Uh, I don't know that we're going to have a lot of ice cream in the next hour, but uh, I'm a work in progress and I'm trying to have more ice cream with people after 35 years of keeping track of every 15 minutes of my time. So, uh, so the story of the lawyer who went to, to heaven and St. Peter greeted him at the pearly gates and said, I only have one question. How is it that according to your timesheets, you're 300 years old? So. <laughs> I'm happy to be here with uh, Sally Bennett, the voice of the Holy Spirit in my life. Uh, we've been married 43 years. Next March, have three grown sons. There she is. Three grown sons and uh, four grandsons. And uh, a fifth grandchild on the way that we found out just a couple weeks ago. So we're believing that there may be a Y chromosome on the way. <laughs> Sally was one of four girls. I, she married me, got three sons, and now four grandsons. So... Uh, the scales are a bit tipped. I wanted to talk today about two things. Um, the, the subject of the talk may present kind of a pragmatic thought of direction. We're going to get to that. We're going to talk about some technical issues around giving and how you can think about saving taxes and support nonprofit organizations that you love and want to support instead of perhaps the U.S. Treasury. But we're also just going to talk about some of the spiritual and emotional realities that are around money and I'm just going to kind of walk you through that book that you have in front of you, um, and we can go page by page quite quickly. But page one, I want to just begin with this oft-repeated at halftime reference to Ephesians 2.10, that you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which were ordained for you beforehand that you might walk in them. Uh, you know, what a profound statement that each of you, Bill Bantz, is God's creation, he's God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which were ordained for him beforehand. When, when God called Jeremiah, he said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you and consecrated you. I have appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. And so we at halftime believe that you've been formed and consecrated and appointed with good works that are part of you. And there's just a question, is that your reality? Do you really know that in your heart, in your DNA, that you were created to be that? Because as that discovery happens, it has a profound effect on how you look at finances, how you look at resources, how you are able ultimately to demote those in service to the passion and the good works that the Lord places on your heart. Bob and Linda, 30 years ago, he had a passion to make a lot of money, but he had a passion to give it away as well. And boy, have they done that over the years. Uh, they were uh, aware of, they became aware of the good works that God ordained for their life. And so I just want to emphasize how important we think that is to try to seek that Ephesians 2.10 calling. But many of us don't have it quite yet. We're in pursuit of it, we're seeking it. But there are things that we can do, I would suggest to you, in anticipation of that discovery that uh, are wise and that actually can propel as opposed to impede our journey toward the DNA that God has put in this and the good works that he intends to, for us to uh, participate in. And so I think the first question I want to just submit to you is, in effect, have you been recreated in Christ Jesus when it comes to finances and financial structure? 
You know, uh, C.S. Lewis said there are two conversions in the Christian faith, the conversion of the heart and the conversion of the pocketbook. There are many, many Christians who claim the Lord as their Savior and Lord, but leave their pocketbook behind. Um, and so what we're here today to talk about is the discovery, in part, of the joy of giving, but a process and a reality, what we contend with on a way to get there. And so on page three, I first referenced the, uh, an image of an iceberg. Um, and I reference it because um, each of us in our own heart has issues and often very deep issues that relate to many things in life, but certainly financial resources. Um, Sally and I have a lake place in Wisconsin. We were there last weekend. And as is often the case, Sally follows me around the house reading to me. You know, and I act disinterested and then I go out and act on it in public and don't give her the credit for it. But last week she's reading to me out of, out of Proverbs 20, verse 5, that says, uh, the purposes of a person's heart are deep waters, but a person of understanding will draw them out. The purposes of a person's heart are deep waters. My experience is that I certainly had money as deep waters in my life. Outwardly, clearly, above the surface of the iceberg, engaged in all kinds of things, but really transformed under the surface all the way to the bottom of that iceberg in terms of Jesus being down there and everything being subservient to him. It's a life process. So an iceberg is the image I begin with. And it's a classic problem. It goes back through the ages, 2,350 Bible verses approximately on the subject of finances, more than twice as many as any other subject. And so there's reason for us to look at this because it can be a real obstacle to a full discovery of our DNA and the good works that the Lord intends for our life. So uh, the issue, in fact, transcends a broad spectrum from world financial markets to our own individual personal por portfolio. So what I've done over the last few years is to dig out of the New Yorker a few cartoons. That I, I love the New Yorker's cartoons and have through the years. So if we go to page three in terms of world financial markets, with the hope that this will bring a little levity to the discussion. Henry, just how much is $100 billion? You know, I don't know about what you think about these days, but it's, is it 17 trillion? Is it 100 billion here, 100 billion there? And what effect does this have on us in our life as we think about it? My Lord, our nation's in incredible debt. It has an effect on us emotionally, psychologically, behaviorally. Uh, so the world financial markets in the context of money is out there pounding on us day by day. But it's also, I think if we're honest with ourselves, a highly personal thing that relates to our own investment portfolios. Well, we've put your money to work. As for what it's doing at the very moment, I have no idea. Uh, the idea that we look at our portfolios and we say, whoa, what's happening to that? Or what did he do? Or what did she do with that particular asset? Now, I remember uh, back in 2007, Sally approached me in the summer of 2007. She said, I have a sense of foreboding about the stock market. She said, I think we should get out of the stock market. And I said, hey, I'm the lawyer business guy. Thanks for your input. <laughs> the next month she comes in and says, you know, I have a sense of foreboding about the stock market. And I say, remember our conversation last month? Well, along comes the fall of 2007 and for about four or five months, we open our monthly statements and we look at them and she kind of looks at me and doesn't say much. And then March of 2008, we we'll open our portfolio and we're at the low point in our investments at that point in time. And she says, you know, we're okay. We've been together a long time. If I would have shot you the first time I thought about it, I'd be out of jail by now. <laughs> She's had plenty of cause for that over the years. So I'd like to suggest to you that the world offers us, offers us two great lies, at least, as it relates to money. Um, one is that money will make us happy, and another is that money will make us secure. And there are a couple of books that I've found uh, over time that I think are particularly good. They're a little bit old by now, but they're still very good. Who Switched Off My Brain, which is a very neat study of brain function and how we can encourage or really disappoint ourselves in terms of how we think, in terms of including issues around money. And then a book, uh, Your Money and Your Brain, which is referenced here, and I just have single copies. Whoever wants them can take them uh, when we're done here. But it's about the science of neuroeconomics. 
And this one, I mean, it sounds a little technical, but to me it was just really kind of a fun read as I got into this thing. But one of the, one of the subjects of does money, will money make us happy? But are the rich a lot happier than those of us who are fortunate enough to live above the poverty line? The surprising answer is no. For years, psychologists have been presenting standardized questions to people all over the world, taking all things together. How would you say things are these days? Are you happy, pretty happy, or not too happy? The answers are usually ranked from one to seven, from not at all happy to extremely happy. On the average, members of the Maasai ethnic group who herd livestock on the arid plains of Kenya and Tanzania score 5.7 on the scale. The Intuit, who live in frigid wilds of northern Greenland, 5.8. The Amish, 5.8. And the Forbes 400 famous rich list, 5.8. In other words, having a vast fortune in America with mansion and Mercedes, chef and trainer, yacht and private jet makes you only marginally happier than the typical Maasai sipping cow's blood mixed with milk in a hut made of dried dung. <laughs> There's quite a spectrum, quite a deception in the world that money can make us happy. And so here's this golfer at the bottom of the page. Researchers, researchers say I'm not happier for being richer, but do you know how much researchers make? So we go on, will money make us secure? Page five, I admit my cup is full, but never runneth over. Feeling poorly? Thank heaven, I thought you said you were feeling poor. So in the world, I submit, in my experience, is that uh, there is a force at work. Jesus talked about it when he referenced for the first time in the Bible the word mammon, that we cannot worship God and mammon. Many Bibles reference money, God and money. I actually prefer the mammon reference. Again, it's the first time the word is used in the Bible. Some sources say it, it, it was an ancient Syrian god of avarice. But my experience in the world is that there is, in effect, there can be a laminate over our resources that's not of the Lord that prevents us from getting access to what the Lord really intends us to have. I've, and I've not, I've not taken an oath of poverty. I enjoy a generous life. Sally and I live very well. I have no problem with very substantial wealth. The issue is whether we're captive to it or whether or not we realize that the ability to create wealth is of the Lord meant for his covenant purposes. And that's a journey. That's a breakthrough that is a highly intimate individual journey. So Jesus references mammon, but then he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we, if we just are honest with ourselves and think, what do we really treasure? Well, I treasure... Sally and my boys, do I treasure my relationship with the Lord? Do I love Jesus more than I love any, everything else? Because if I treasure him, that's where my heart's going to be. I spent a lot of years with one foot on the dock and one in the boat in terms of how much do I accumulate, how much do I give to the Lord, uh, and quite frankly, in my own life, uh, what I did, I've run a private foundation supporting Christian ministry for about 30 years, in 2000, that became a Christian Community Foundation, which is now part of the National Christian Foundation. And I began speaking about that in 2001. And I'm referencing this because I'm aware of the fact that the voice is a little bit off today. I was hit in 2001, which, which is actually after a very busy season in my life. My best corporate client merged with its main competitor in 1999, and then we went public in the year 2000. I had pneumonia a couple times, working my tail off, very worn down. Uh, got to 2001, January 2001, and I was speaking for the first time to a group of people about this community foundation that I created. And afterwards, an individual came up to me and said, hey, what's going on with the voice? And that began a six-year journey where I descended through a neurological disorder to a place where I had no voice for six years. Now, there weren't all that many people in the Twin Cities that were upset about one lawyer who couldn't talk. <laughs> but I was the guy. July of 2004 was the bottom point. Sally and I went to uh, The Passion, Mel Gibson's movie about Jesus. And in the opening scene in the garden, they quote Isaiah 55.3. And it, it's the famous passage, passage that says, not only by his stripes are you healed, but it says that he was persecuted. He was, in effect, tortured for our peace. Uh, he uh, went through, in that movie, in, in real life, a process of torture for my peace. Um, when I walked out of that movie, 
having in my life been able to kind of power my way through most situations. I said to myself in July 2004, hey, if he went through that for me so that I could be peaceful, I'm going to claim it. I'm going to take his price for something I can't get to. And it was at that moment as I departed that I was actually kind of okay with the thought that I might not have a voice. But it was also a point in time where I lost my fear of man, a lot of my performance uh, anxiety, and in many respects a sense of uh, peace and place around the issue of money. I had been flying to Chicago monthly and then quarterly for Botox injections through the larynx in order to uh, you know, alleviate the muscle spasms that prevented my speech. Between 2004, July of 2004 and November of 2006, the trips decreased and in November of 2006, my doc said, hey, Mr. Bennett, on rare occasions the voice settles. It's uh, not really medically understood how it happens, but I don't know if I'm going to see you again. That was November of 2006. I haven't seen him since November of 2006. In the top 2% of medical case studies, a restored voice with that neurological disorder, attributable certainly to good medicine, but also to prayer, a, an experience that I would never surrender for the benefit that was part of it. And part of it was Jesus took me deeper than I was ever able to go myself. And part of that was in the context of money. And was I worshiping, seeking to worship God and mammon? Uh, so I was able to demote money at that point in time. And in doing that, it freed it up for me in a way that has made a giant difference. So mammon, uh, you know, if you're, if you're interested in demonic figures and dungeons and dragons, this is a picture of the arch demon of greed and lust. If you don't want to really get into the demonic, but you like a picture of an old miser, here's a guy that you know, claims his identity and his security and his money. But then also we see it reflected in the world. If you're not into the demonic or the miserly images, you know, think about the marketplace, think about the business community. And so again, just a series of little cartoons out of the New Yorker. Here at page seven, I'm not a machine, Deborah. I can't just turn my greed on and off. Or at the bottom, being in possession of great wealth made me a bit self-conscious at first, but I finally came to terms with it. You can just look at these cartoons. I won't go through each of them and just think about not so much you singing to the choir in many respects, but the world. We contend with money in ways that uh, can really cripple our ability to discover the joy of giving and to be who God created us to be in Christ Jesus for good works that have been preordained for us. So um, I just commend the cartoons to your uh, review at your leisure. If you go to page 11, um, in my own journey, which I call the road to vertical giving. You know, Sally and I started off 35 years ago when Andy, our then four-year-old, uh, was four years old. We thought we should go to church for his benefit. So we, after about a 10-year gap in that, started going back to church. And you know, in the early days, I threw a few bucks in the plate. I uh, didn't want him to have my contact information. Uh, then I started writing checks. And sure enough, the next thing I knew, we were in the nursery because they had our contact information. Um, and over the years, we just progressed through uh, increased giving uh, toward what I call a generosity journey, pledging smaller amounts, then learning to tithe, then realizing that it's tithes and offerings. And a number of years ago, uh, the question of uh, loving God and our neighbor, the first commandment, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And we said, well, what's it really mean to love our neighbor as ourselves? And we looked at our boys, you know, who were basically taking us for everything they could get. We said, well, if we're investing in our boys to this quantifiable extent, how do we invest in neighbor in a, in a comparable extent? So for a number of years, we've had a simple practice at Christmas where we make a gift to each of our sons and their families into their donor-advised fund that we call neighbor. And then at Easter, several months later, we sit together at Easter dinner and we say, okay, what did you all do? with respect to uh, what the Lord was able to provide at Christmas. And it's a way in which we've been able to help train up our boys and their families, and we're going to do the same thing with our grandchildren. Again, trying to break, break the cycle, the lamination effect of mammon on the families' lives. Ultimately, we then, many of us in halftime, get to the question of how much is enough. Um, and that's a big question. And so at page 12, We've got a cartoon that's actually a little more difficult to see, but here's a group of men sitting around, presumably their club, 
Shortly after I realized I had plenty, I realized there was plenty more. I, now, I would say in my own life, you know, I have a couple of times or more, I've set a barrier that said, or an obstacle, if I get to this level, that'll be enough. And then uh, I got there and it wasn't enough. Um, and so I'm here to tell you that it's not a number. Uh, it's really a demotion. It's a life view. And what I've done here, and I'm not going to go into it, is last June in Minneapolis, we hosted the National Christian Foundation Twin Cities, which I am involved with, hosted Ron Blue. Ron Blue and Terry Parker and Larry Burkett are the three founders of the National Christian Foundation. And Ron Blue gave a presentation. To, there were about 100 people that we had there. He gave a presentation on how much is enough. And we recorded it. And what I've given you here for your later review is an executive summary, which I personally like myself, but then the transcript of Ron Blue's remarks. And I just commend it to your review because it's insightful. He's a fabulous guy, 10 years older than I. Tremendous wisdom and insight, a prolific author, you know, a real authority on these challenging questions. So you might just take a look at that executive summary and that transcript, which you'll be happy to hear, constitutes about half the bulk of this uh, Kool-Aid without water attachment that I've given you. So, so much for the spirituality and the emotional realities of giving. I don't want to race past them, and I haven't. I commend them to your consideration and to the honest question of whether the purposes of our heart, which are deep waters, really allow us to take Jesus to the bottom of that experience and submit the whole issue of finances and the structure of our finances in a way that serves the Ephesians 2.10 calling that he set forth for our life. So I want to move on to the more practical, which may be the real reason why you're here as you read the subject of the, of the presentation. And the question I ask, beginning at page 41, is how am I going to invest both now and in the future whether or not I've identified my Ephesians 2.10 calling? Um, and I would like to submit to you, first of all, that uh, you might think about anticipating that you're going to want some seed capital. Uh, you have a unique calling. Each of you is unique. God has giftedness in you that he planned and preordained for your life. My experience personally I think as Bob's experience and the experience of a lot of halftimers is that as we discover our Ephesians 2.10 calling, it's a transcendent life experience. It, it, there's a connection of intimacy with the Lord where it just kind of takes over and it's wonderful and it, you feel more connected than you've ever felt and in many respects you're the only one that feels that way. You feel that way uniquely as it relates to your own gift and you may find an area of service that you're very passionate about and there may be many ministries in it that would be happy to get your resources. But many times, half-timers especially are very creative marketplace-related people, and they've got ideas about how they could structure entities or they could build joint ventures or partnerships. There's a, there's a creative entrepreneurial bent within many of us. And my experience with that is that in anticipation of that, it's not a bad idea to think about how are you going to begin to capitalize that in preparation for the revelation that the Lord's going to give it to you, and you may, just like a business, need some seed capital in the early days. And I think a lot of kingdom development is like corporate finance. You begin with a, uh, with a founder that puts his own you know, stake in the ground and has money in the game. And then as the, if the business grows, certain other people are attracted to it. So you can go through rounds of financing. Now, a couple of buddies may, invent, may, may invest uh, and then it grows and potac potentially uh, it goes public. You're at a place in time where uh, you're ready to reveal it to the world. Halftime, in many respects, has followed that course through Bob and Linda's incredible generosity. They've had an active board engagement. We're now in a season of transition where we're moving to make halftime more known to other people and to create partnerships with other institutions. So there is a sequence, but when it comes on you and the Lord's passion comes on you, you want to jump out of your clothes because you're so pumped about it. Um, one area of potential discouragement is that as you share your enthusiasm, not everybody in the room is going to be dancing with you. Okay, so the notion of how do I creatively think about some seed capital is something that I would recommend you think about. Um, next, uh, you don't have to spend a whole ton of time around this, but you know, the winds of change exist in legislation uh, and in government. Um, what's going to happen to the charitable deduction? You know, Isaiah 33, 22, 
is a verse that says the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, and the Lord is our judge. Lawgiver, king, and judge. Isaiah 33, 22 is a verse that our founding fathers relied on significantly in, in founding our legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government. Uh, these days, it's not exactly a combination of church and state. The direction's going the other, the other way, and so there is, in all aspects of government, a thirst for revenue. It's not just the executive branch or the legislative branch. Both sides of the aisle uh, have proposals that are emerging that relate to how much can one deduct for what one gives. And this administration, for several years, has had a focus on the uh, reality that the current charitable deduction is 50% of adjusted gross income in a combination of cash and appreciated property. This administration is talking about a limit of 29% of adjusted gross income on all itemized deductions, not just charitable contributions. A lot of people have mortgages. If they deduct their interest expense, that's going to cut into their ability to deduct their charitable contributions. So what that points to, and there's no immediate threat of this, in fact, at the end of 2012, there was kind of a relief because the charitable deduction was not impacted. The NCF monitors this on an ongoing basis. But what it really points to is 90 plus percent of, of Christian giving is cash. What are some other ways that we can give? And what are some other ways that we can think about supporting ministry? And ministries are supported by charitable contributions, endowment income, or fee income. So as you think about your favorite ministries with presumably halftime at the very top, you know, there are three things that we can do to uh, support halftime, charitable contributions, encouragement around the idea of fee income, and endowment income. Those are three. Think of those in the context of your own favorite ministries. Few ministries see this coming. We can be of help to ministries that we love by helping them anticipate the probable change in legislative uh, policy making around that issue. So it's all aspects of government. I just, I attached a brief article uh, you may or may not want to read it, but the Supreme Court sits at a 5-4 majority, and Justice Kennedy is the swing vote in most, ca most cases. This case is an Arizona case that sustained charitable deductions for certain education credits, but it was a 5-4 decision. Uh, the minority wrote a very, a very wonderful, well, I didn't view it so wonderful, but it was a very reasoned opinion that the subsidy of education in a Christian school was an unconstitutional interference, an unconstitutional support of religious activities. So all I'm saying is that it's not just the executive branch, it's the legislative branch, the judicial branch, and if there's a change in the Supreme Court in the next three years, uh, it's highly likely that there'll be a 5-4 majority, which will go the other way in terms of uh, our creative ability to support the kingdom. That's not a political statement. That's just a reality that we're hanging in the balance. You know, we know justices can decide things any way they feel called to do it. But uh, be aware of the, rea re of the fact that we need to stay creative when it comes to uh, structuring our financial plans. So beyond that issue, the next one I want to reference um, is establishing your own storehouse for Christian giving. <coughs> The National Christian Foundation is the world's largest faith-based provider of donor-advised funds. Um, donor-advised funds are one very fast-growing mechanism for charitable giving. We at the National Christian Foundation think uh, that donor-advised funds are like smartphones. Within a few years, everybody who gives away more than maybe 10 grand a year is going to have a donor-advised fund because they're just so simple. Donor-advised funds are tax-exempt almost like checking slash savings account under the umbrella of a public charity. So the National Christian Foundation is a public charity. We have 12,000 funds on behalf of individuals, couples, nonprofit organizations, corporations. And the way it works is you make a contribution into your donor advised fund. You get a fair market value tax deduction. So Sally and I have the Jay and Sarah Bennett family fund. We do our charitable contributions into the Jay and Sarah Bennett Family Fund. We get a fair market value tax deduction from the National Christian Foundation. And then that money sits in our donor advised fund until we come along and say, hey, uh, please make a distribution to halftime. And then within 24 hours, the NCF, National Christian Foundation, cuts a check to halftime. 
Um, one of the beauties of a donor-advised fund, and certainly in many respects a private foundation as well, one of the beauties of it is that it allows you to give vertically to the Lord. It's not a question of, in many respects, horizontally to a nonprofit organization. Even your church, you might not have liked the sermon last week, so you're not just not going to quite give them quite as much. Or the board of directors has a couple of nasty people on it. The world interferes oftentimes with our fleshly giving horizontally to nonprofit organizations. The beauty of having a place to go vertically with it, like a donor advice fund, is it makes it a matter between you and the Lord. I'm going to give out of obedience. Uh, he's got DNA that he put within me that was ordained for me before I was even created. And he did that. He loves me so much, and he's calling me out to my Ephesians 2.10 calling. And guess what? I'm going to invest in that. And I'm going to use my accumulated experience and my creativity to think about how I can even maybe even make more and invest in that. So we go vertical with the Lord with our tithes and our offerings, and we do it in ways beyond cash, which we'll be getting to here in a minute. So the idea of establishing a storehouse, um, and I'm not going to get into the details of this, but donor advised funds and private foundations are two great mechanisms for how people can invest in causes that they care about. There are significant differences between the two. If you're curious about those, I've got information on it. You can email me. I'll send it right back to you. It matches up the differences, the benefits, and there are benefits to each side of the equation. Um, one of the real benefits of a donor advice fund is that it's a public charity. So when you make charitable contributions, you can deduct the fair market value of the asset, as opposed in many cases to the cost basis of the asset, which can often be much less. I'm not going to share any details on the Bufords, but I'm going to use their example that Linda and Bob shared yesterday um, with respect to a piece of art. Again, we won't talk numbers, but they... Linda mentioned yesterday in a breakout session that uh, she had a little pot of honey, that's what I call it, out of which she can support nonprofit organizations. And, and the way that was funded, it was very briefly referenced yesterday, was with the uh, Community Foundation of Texas, which offers donor advised funds. Now, what they did is they bought one or more pieces of art years ago, sat on the wall in a second bedroom in their home. And uh, through the years, they enjoyed looking at it, but at some point in time, they decided, hey, let's take a look at what's this worth. So they decided to take a look at what, what's it worth. They perhaps made contact with Sotheby's. It was an organization that could tell them the value of that artwork. It had appreciated a thousand plus percent. So what they did is they contributed the artwork to a public charity, into a donor advised fund. That public charity retained Sotheby's to sell the art and the proceeds from the sale went into the donor advised fund and created a pot of honey for Linda and Bob to give away over time. They never... <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Duly, duly noted. Duly noted. Yeah, there is a difference. But what a fantastic mechanism. Something goes up, a, it goes up a thousand percent in value, you never pay any tax on the gain. You give it to the kingdom by giving away something other than cash. And I want to move into that description next. Okay, so the idea is create a storehouse. You know, Joseph was in prison. He came out, he read Pharaoh's dreams. You know, and he was, Pharaoh was impressed. He says, uh, guess what? We're going to have seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. Uh, and Joseph says, hey, let's build some storehouses. Well, in the marketplace and in the lives of half-timers, there can be seasons of plenty. There can be liquidity events, there can be inheritances, there can be sales of businesses, there can be sales of business interests, there can be real estate opportunities, there can be all kinds of things. And you don't immediately think about, gee, I'm going to gift this property to XYZ 501c3. You just, if it's worth you know, 500 grand, you just think, I'm just not going to do that to, to my church or thing. But what if you have your own mechanism, a storehouse, the Jay and Sarah Bennett Family Fund? Where you can say, Lord, thank you for the appreciation and value of that. I, I give you thanks for that, and I'm going to give that asset to you. So you contribute it into your donor advised fund, and then at the appropriate time, it's sold, it becomes liquid, and it fuels your ability to support passions that you have for the kingdom. No capital gain, which uh, can take a big chunk out of the proceeds of the sale, okay? So the idea of having a storehouse and distribution center for kingdom wealth, I think, is an important concept. Once again, if anybody wants to chat about this or email me, I don't presume you do, but if you want to talk about it, I'd love to 
have ice cream with you and talk about it at some point in time. Okay, so I'm at page 48. Um, I just broke this out. This is just an SBA personal financial statement. You know, I suspect if we had all of us raise our hands, one or more of us in our lifetime has completed a personal financial statement to submit to a bank in support of some kind of a credit application. But what I want to just reference here, um, and these are just arbitrary numbers. Don't get fixated on how much money this couple makes or what their net worth might be or anything else. They certainly have accumulated some nice value, and it may seem like a lot of value to some and not so much to others. Uh, I hope that you'll actually think about your own situation and the context how, how it might plug into a personal financial statement. But let's just go down this in the upper left-hand corner and just look at what some of these assets are, realizing, that, as is stated at the bottom of the page, 90% of gifts, charitable gifts, come from net take-home cash. That's after-tax money and it's cash. And yet 90 plus percent of what many of us own isn't in liquid form. It's not cash. It might be artwork. 70% of Christians don't have an updated estate plan. And 90% of them don't have an updated estate plan that leaves anything to the Lord's work. You know, Bob says when we get to heaven, he thinks there are two questions. What did he do with my son and what did he do with my stuff? You know, I, I want to be able to answer that question at the pearly gates. Sally and I have an estate plan. It's a very simple estate plan. If I go first, Sally's provided for. When we're both gone, each of our three sons gets something less than what they might have hoped for, for sure. Everything else goes into our donor advised fund, and our three boys are the advisors to that fund. We pay no taxes on, uh, on our estate. Now, we have some state tax challenges in Minnesota, which is very liberal heavily taxed state. But, you know, again, we're not going to take a showing of hands, but how many of us have updated estate plans that have a piece in them that leaves something to the Lord's work? I just encourage you to think about it. And if you don't have that, think about finding a buddy who can help you get that. But here on this personal financial statement, let's just go back to the upper left-hand corner. So this individual doesn't keep a ton of cash in uh, his checking account. He's got some money in his savings account. He's got an IRA or other retirement account with uh, looks like 300 grand in it. Deferred compensation accounts are one of the best places for long-term charitable giving, testamentary giving that you can potentially access. Deferred compensation plans have the deferral of the taxation, but Uncle Sam ultimately comes and gets you. So if you have a 401k plan or a pension or a profit sharing plan, and in your HR department you've got a beneficiary designation form that says if I check out, Sally's the primary beneficiary of my 401k plan. But then if I've listed my secondary beneficiary of my estate plan as the estate of Jay Bennett, that's part of my estate. And if Sally has that designation, it's part of her estate. So that when we're both gone, Uncle Sam comes back and he says, guess what? I not only want estate taxes, I want deferred income taxes, and you can easily lose 70% of your 401k plan or your profit sharing plan. So this is a tremendous mechanism simply to go to the HR department, say I want a new beneficiary designation form, and then list Sally Bennett as your first, you, know, you don't have to list Sally Bennett, but I, 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 sh I should list Sally Bennett, but then, but then list a charitable purpose so that when Sally's gone, Whatever the balance in that goes to the Lord's work. It's, it's a small issue, but it's a big tax savings issue in terms of how you structure your strategy, Bob. Yeah. Income with respect to the decedent is deferred income taxes. No, no, no. It skips that, right. So, yeah, it's, a, it's worth looking at. It gets me, it, this gets us into the weeds a little bit. I'd be happy to chat about that. I just want to go down what most of us just don't realize in terms of assets that we may have ownership of that we aren't thinking about giving to halftime or any other nonprofit organization that we love. So deferred compensation accounts, okay? Accounts and notes receivable, life insurance. Many of us have carried life insurance during years where we felt we needed to do that as responsible 
mothers or fathers in the event something happened to us, we need to be able to fund the ongoing lifestyle of our families. Many of those policies have cash values in them. You can contribute a life insurance policy into a donor advised fund and you can get a tax deduction for the cash value of the life insurance policy and then the policy can either be liquidated inside the donor advised fund and the cash go to your designated ministry or remain in your fund or you can make tax deductible contributions every year into your donor advised fund to pay the premium on that life insurance, com uh, life insurance policy so that when the death benefit's payable, it goes to a ministry of your choice. So how many of us thought about giving a life insurance policy to support the kingdom? It's an opportunity that we have that's right in front of us. Okay, stocks and bonds, real estate, I'm gonna come back to those things. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, I've already mentioned, and that was personal property. Um, you know, the Buford's example of giving appreciated art is a classic example of how they uh, watched something appreciate in value as they enjoyed it, and then uh, gave it away, got a significant tax benefit for doing that, um, and funded a little pot of honey for Linda, and only for Linda. So again, uh, I'm blowing through a lot of information here, but think about a personal financial statement. Make a list confidentially of what you've accumulated, and think creatively about how it can be used to satisfy the Lord's uh, need for it you know, in the kingdom. Okay, just a couple other things I wanted to talk about. One is publicly traded stock. Um, it's a stunning reality that, again, 90 plus percent of giving, and certainly Christian giving, is cash. People write checks. So the next easiest thing to think about giving is publicly traded stock. And so when Sally and I want to make a gift into the Jay and Sarah Bennett Family Fund, what we do is we call up our investment manager. We say, hey, Andy, take a look at our portfolio. If there's anything in it that's appreciated, you know, we'd like to make a $20,000 gift into our donor advised fund because we have a ministry that we want to support. So our investment manager, Andy, looks at our portfolio and he sees that we bought Ford Motor Company stock at five bucks a share and now it's 10 bucks a share. So if we want to transfer 2,000 shares of Ford Motor Company stock into our donor advice fund, Andy does it. He wire transfer. He doesn't sell the stock. He wire transfers the stock from our investment account to, in our case, the National Christian Foundation. The National Christian Foundation receives 20 or 2,000 shares of Ford Motor Company stock, and it sells it, and the cash from the proceeds goes into our donor advice fund. We never pay capital gain on the increase between $5 and $10, and we get a, uh, a $20,000 tax deduction. I know I'm getting into the weeds here a little bit. Sometimes it helps to draw pictures of these things. We could potentially draw them. And if we have ice cream, I'd be happy to draw the pictures. But the idea is just think about giving publicly traded stock instead of cash. That's, there's a huge benefit in that. You save capital gain. And then if you're gonna write a $20,000 check, just write the $20,000 check back to Andy. Give it back to your investment manager, and he can buy 2,000 shares of Ford Motor Company stock at $10 to put the same number of shares right back in your investment account, but now you've got a $10 cost basis, not $5. So write the check to your investment manager and have him or her transfer the shares to a donor advice fund or other tax-exempt entity, okay? That's, this is a very important issue, and it relates to donor advised funds, and that's one of the key distinctions between a private foundation and a donor advised fund. A donor advised fund is called a donor advised fund, not a donor directed fund, because once I make, once Sally and I make a gift of stock or other assets into our donor advised fund, we get a tax deduction from the National Christian Foundation, but we give up ownership of that asset. The NCF is now the owner of that asset. And it goes about liquidating it, and now we've got the cash sitting over there in our donor advice fund, which is owned by the National Christian Foundation. Then we come along and we advise, we don't direct the NCF to make a distribution to halftime. The NCF supported 23,000 different nonprofits last year, it, you know, but the NCF is, or any donor advice fund provider is obligated, and the IRS audits this, to make an independent confirmation that the distribution is appropriate. So there is the risk with a donor advised fund that the nonprofit organization that has it might say, uh-uh, we're not going to make a distribution to that. You know, um, 
I've had that happen twice in my experience, and in both cases I just facilitated the gift a different way. But that's one, asset, that's one reality with donor advised funds, where a private foundation got a little bit more control around that, because it's you and your spouse and your three kids who are the board of directors, or it's a slightly expanded board, but there's more control, less tax benefit. Foundations have to be created. There are corporate entities that have to be set up. You have to file a 1023 federal application. Right now, the IRS is reviewing applications that were filed in May of 2012. Um, uh, there are annual compliance uh, issues, filing of a 990, public notice of where you made your gifts, uh, tax returns, other expenses that are associated with it. And, Depends upon the size of it. A lot of people that have foundations that are two million bucks or less are flipping into donor advised funds. Costs nothing to set up a donor advised fund. There's no tax return. Uh, there's no cost to make distributions. Um, it's, it's, uh, it can be anonymous. I have a guy who was a conservative guy in the Twin Cities who supported uh, opposition to a gay rights marriage. He did it through his private foundation and his corporation got picketed the next day because it was information that was traceable. He, he's been giving through his donor advised fund since that time, but there are, there are benefits to both. And clearly control is an advantage of a private foundation. No doubt about that. But this point. Yeah, with respect to a private foundation, you can deduct up to 30% of your annual adjusted gross income in the form of 20% of that can be appreciated property like stock, and the next 10% has to be cash, 30%. Donor advised funds are 50%. 30% appreciated property, 20% cash. And to the extent you can't use the tax deduction in the year you make the gift, in both cases, you can roll it forward for five years. So if you have a large sum and you want to give away a chunk of it, um, you can uh, use that deduction over a period of six tax returns in effect. Okay, but the question of donor advised funds that Linda raises is a good one. It's an important thing to understand because you know you're no longer the owner. Our view is that the Lord's the owner, and we we want him to be the owner. Yeah, they're they're really exploding in terms of their popularity. Um, with the National Christian Foundation, we manage about two billion dollars. We only manage about two billion dollars because. We have what we call 70, we have throughput, which is the percentage of resources that go out to nonprofits every year versus that which comes in. And we, for over 15 years, have had 70 plus percent throughput. So in 2013, we had about 910 million came into our donor advised funds and 670 million went out. You don't build a corpus of investment as quickly when you're distributing 70 percent as opposed to many community foundations that give out three to five percent and have big endowments on which they uh, sponsor their own programs. So, um, but it's a very good point. With an NCF, if you have $300,000 or more in your donor advised fund, you can have your own money manager, money professional manage those resources. So he or she can manage both your personal and your charitable wealth. Okay, I'm sure time must be getting short. I've got a couple of other comments. One is with respect to the gifting of stock. That's not publicly traded stock. We at the National Christian Foundation call gifts liquid gifts or non-liquid gifts. L liquid gifts are cash and publicly traded stock. There's a market for both, easy to give. But then we also spend a lot of time doing what we call non-liquid gifts. And these are gifts of corporate interests of closely held, privately owned C corporations or S corporations or limited liability companies or real estate or other kinds of assets. And so we do transactions uh, regularly um, one example of which, no names referenced, no values referenced, is an individual who many years ago bought an uh, interest in a software company. Um, and he bought it for X amount of money. And over a period of years, that value escalated very substantially. Um, and he became aware of the fact and had been encouraging the company to seek a liquidity event. And he had determined in his own heart that uh, he was going to give half of this value to his Ephesians 2.10 calling, what he felt passionate about. So prior to the time that the deal closed, prior to the time that the deal closed, this individual transferred half of his stock in this entity 
to the National Christian Foundation. So that at closing, the buyer came along and bought that stock from the National Christian Foundation and bought the rest of his stock from him. Now, with respect to what he sold personally, he owed capital gain on the years of appreciation, what he kept for himself. But what, with respect to what he gifted before closing to the National Christian Foundation, he avoided many years of capital gain. And he got a fair market value tax deduction for that gift, which substantially offset the tax liability on what he kept for himself. It was a win-win deal. Saved a pile of taxes capitalized his giving fund in a way to support his Ephesians 2.10 calling and helped structure his kingdom financial plan in a way that was able to allocate resources to the ministry that was on his heart instead of the U.S. Treasury. Now, the issue there is that this can be what the IRS calls a prearranged sale. You can't make the gift the day before closing because the IRS comes along and says, hey, all the I's were dotted, all the T's were crossed, the documents were signed, We'll let you take the tax deduction, but we're going to impute that income to you anyway. So you have to make that gift probably 30 days, sometimes less than that, prior to closing so that you can argue that the deal still could have fallen apart. There's still some loose ends in it, so I don't have to recognize that income. And the NCF doesn't recognize income as a public charity. And so uh, the idea that we call it is don't sell, then give. If you sell and take all the proceeds, then all the proceeds are taxable. Give, then sell. Determine what piece of the business you want to give to the Lord. Give it, and then allow that to be bought out at the time of closing uh, in a way that avoids gain. So Sally and I did that in 2005 and 2007 when we sold business interests that we'd had for 25 years. In advance of closing, in each of these two liquidity opportunities, we said prayerfully, okay, Lord, we're going to give you X percent of the deal. And uh, that has been in our donor advice fund. It's invested, and we give it away on an ongoing basis. So the idea of giving appreciated closely held assets is just something else I would submit for your consideration and other kinds of assets, real estate, uh, whether it's a hydroelectric plant in upstate New York or a camp on uh, Lake Foley in northern Minnesota or a soybean crop in uh, western Minnesota. There are assets that if we list them on our personal financial statement, uh, the Lord has entrusted to us that we can creatively structure in ways that uh, bless the purposes that he's put on our heart. So in conclusion, I do think that there are things that we can do to structure a financial plan for our kingdom purpose, even before it's revealed to us. If we think creatively about what we have on hand and we look forward to potential liquidity events or opportunities to see assets that we could convert into cash and give to the kingdom we can anticipate doing those things. And a real good way of thinking about it is to look at your personal financial statement and think about giving assets other than cash. Deuteronomy uh, 8.18 says it's, uh, the ability to create wealth is from the Lord, meant for his covenant purposes. And what a joy it is to realize that the ability to create wealth is something that he gives us. And he means to give it to us so that we can support his work. And as that happens, in my experience, the DNA that he puts in us, the good works that he ordained for us beforehand, just begin to emerge and life just becomes a whole lot more fulfilling. And we've, many of us have been in preparation for that through the marketplace engagement that we've had. It doesn't need to be a radical shift. It can be using giftedness that's been accumulated and employing them in new ways for God's glory. So I think that may be it. I don't know if there are any questions or we be happy to have a little ice cream now for a few minutes. A public foundation. Uh, yes, yes, it would. When a tax exempt entity is created, there is an initial five year term from the time the IRS gives you tax exempt status, where if you fill out your application the right way, you're deemed to be a public charity. Uh, there's something called a public support test, which is actually an equation that's got a numerator in it and a denominator in it. And at the end of that first five year period, if you can show that the percentage of what has come in to your entity can go in the numerator uh, with everything that comes in going in the denominator, if you can get enough in the numerator, then you can be an ongoing public charity which has benefits to it. 
Um, if you're the sole source of support for that entity that was set up at the end of five years, the IRS comes along and says, hey, you didn't satisfy the public support test, you're now a private foundation. So there is that window of five years of opportunity where you can do that. And at the moment, resources that come into that entity through a donor advised fund go into the numerator. So uh, even if at the moment, even if you're the sole source of support, if you don't write checks directly to that more private entity, but use a donor, donor advised fund to process resources into that, um, you may sustain your um, public support test. Now that is a loophole that, uh, you know, if we get through tax reform, who knows what's going to happen to that. Sally Bennett. Yeah, we're in a season where we're seeking to give ourselves away. That we don't charge anything. I'm not presuming you'd have any interest in chatting, but it's our joy to help people discover these things because we know that as they do and employ them to the Lord's glory, it just makes life a lot better. So uh, we are available and uh, would love to chat and have ice cream at another date. Yeah, that's a great question. A lot of good folks set up corporate entities. You know, there are tax restrictions on how much of your net profits you can give to charity. Uh, we, we know quite a few people that have set up as corporations or LLCs, and they have member control agreements where going into the deal, they specify with their partner, hey, look, you know, this, we view this as a kingdom business, and so we're going to structure a piece of our even revenue on some occasions many times profitability to be able to allocate to that to the kingdom. Sometimes the founder and his or her partner are the ones that control that and it's a deal between the two of them depending upon ownership of the entity. Some companies bring their people into that. Some companies create committees of people and rotate people to evaluate things that they might support. Typically when you expand that kind of a committee, you narrow down the spectrum of permissible subjects. You don't allow gifts on the extreme liberal or conservative end of giving because that creates issues of difference among the ranks. But yes, I mean, corporate entities can set up charitable giving conduits in ways that are very creative. And in many cases, it's a very, very positive thing for the morale of the people. Um, this individual that I worked with last fall on a gift uh, uh, had a uh, charitable aspect of what the company did and made notice of that to the employees. and. That was uh, generally deemed to be a good thing. So happy to chat about that further. But yes, you can do that through corporate entities as well. Yeah, um, Sally and I set up the uh, Andrew Bennett, Thomas Bennett, and Robert Bennett donor advice funds years ago. And uh, we've used it as a training mechanism around giving and serving. And so the those are the donor advice funds into which we make contributions at Christmas. Now their wives are part of it. We intend to do the same thing for our grandchildren to nurture that and then not just give the money but track the experience and help expose them to things that are of meaning to them. So yeah, it's a, it's a training mechanism that is a good thing. Train up a child in the way he or she should go and when he or she is a bit older they may not depart from it. Yeah, the question is how do you provide support to individuals Generally and technically, gifts out of a donor advised fund have to go to a 501c3 tax exempt entity. There are appropriate mechanisms to give to benevolent funds. And in the case of hardship, which is defined in the Internal Revenue Code and the regs to make gifts to individuals. However, that's an audit trigger, and so it's more complicated to do that. But there are entities through which you can make distributions out of a donor advice fund that do provide benevolence funds and oftentimes a church or another organization that surrounds that challenged family or whatever can be a conduit for that gift but that is a, that's a very good question um, yeah we facilitate that but that's not the that's not the business tree we're in we call it ministry business but yes
going to get a tax benefit from it. I mean, the money I gave up in the last year, I got zero tax benefit for because of everything I'd already given. Right? So my wife tells me to say, well, you know, let's just hand this out to people who need it because we're not going to get any tax benefit for it. But down the road, as very likely, tax benefit Absolutely. And we need champions to show us how that's done. Uh, you know, render under Caesar what is Caesar's, and render under the Lord what is the Lord. But don't let Caesar tell you what you can give. You know, if, if the Lord motivates you to give to somebody and you don't get a deduction, well, hooray for that. The individual that I referenced earlier that sold a substantial business last fall will not be able to claim a full deduction for the large amount that he gave, but. He's got a passion for the Lord and for the purposes that, you know, he's got a life that is very much alive. 